welcome everybody and uh, welcome to this semester of the Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium. Um, just as a precaution, we're going to be broadcasting on Zoom exclusively, although later in the semester we'll be inviting some of the speakers um, into Heidelberg so that everybody will be able to meet them in person, even though the colloquium will be on Zoom. Um, but today we're very, very pleased to welcome Anna Frankiovac to Heidelberg, virtually at least, for the first colloquium in the series. Um, as you will, most of you will be aware, the last decade has um, heralded the beginning of neutral neutrino astronomy in, 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 a, in, a, in a real way. And Anna, our speaker, has um, been one of the leading people trying to understand where the first neutrinos which have been detected have been emitted and what the physical mechanisms behind these um, very high energy events are. And most particularly, Anna has been one of the true pioneers trying to pin down the component of high energy neutrino events with um, transient sources of, of different points. And it is started already with her PhD at the University of Bonn, which uh, she finished in 2011, two years before any neutrino had been detected uh, uh, from outside the sun, um, uh, which, she, and her PhD was actually um, based on trying to look for neutrino events associated with supernovae, which, which he did by looking for optical transients uh, correlations with neutrino events. I think that was with Ice Cube, even at that time, wasn't it, Anna? Yeah, it was already with Ice Cube. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, that was not completed yet. So, you know, this was very brave because, of course, at that point, <laughs> there were no events. Um, but um, during her Anna's postdoc, which was at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory and the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, she redoubled her efforts. And during that time, in 2013, the first uh, PEV neutrino was detected, um, uh, astrophysical neutrino was detected by Ice Cube experiment. And we'll hear a lot more about that from Anna later. But um, uh, this sort of really um, validated and, and, and provided the impulse for a, gr a great growth in the um, um, uh, sort of multi wavelength um, analysis of the origin of these these events. And then uh, 2015, Anna returned to Germany, to uh, Daisy Zeuthen, where uh, a year later, she actually founded an Emmy, um, an Emmy Nota. No, sorry, it wasn't Emmy Nota. It was actually um, uh, Fraunhofer Group, I think. Emholt. Emholt, sorry. Emholt. <laughs> uh, and um, where she was the group leader. And um, she was at that time already um, redoubling the efforts into looking to the transi optical transient counterparts with the um, uh, with 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 the um, um, uh, what was the name of that telescope? Um, Zwicky transient telescope. And in 2020, um, Anna was called to be a full professor in Bochum University researching into the topic of today's talk, which is multi-messenger astronomy with high energy neutrinos. So thank you, Anna, please take it away from there. Thank you so much for, for this invitation. I'm very happy to tell you a bit more about multi-messenger astronomy with high energy neutrinos. Um, so let me set the stage first. Uh, what is multi-messenger astronomy? I like to compare it to this picture of um, blind men touching an elephant um, and each of them is touching a very different part of the of the elephant and they will never figure out what kind of animal they are dealing with if they don't talk to each other and basically exchange the data that they have collected by touching the elephant and I think the same is true for the for the high energy universe and its different messengers so while classically we do astronomy with uh, visible light. Every time we added another wavelength, we, le we learned a great deal about the universe in addition to just looking at, at a single 
at a, as a, at a single wavelength because we can now trace different processes in the in the universe by looking at different wavelengths. Um, but the same is true here. Um, similar to the blind man, we have to talk to each other and combine our data, exchange our measurements to um, get a more complete, deeper understanding of, uh, of the universe. Um, so recently, we have added three new messengers um, to, the, to the picture. So classically, we do astronomy with visible light, but we can add now all kind of different wavelengths ranging from radio to high energy gamma rays. But in addition to the electromagnetic radiation, we can also look at different messengers. And those are gravitational waves, neutrinos, and cosmic rays. So let me start with cosmic rays. They constantly bombard us from all directions. And um, we, we find that they have incredible high energies. Um, as can be seen here, so this is the cosmic ray spectrum, and I don't want to go into details because um, there would be a, a talk in itself. Um, the only point I want to make is that they reach energies of uh, above 10 to the 20 electron volts. That's 10 million times more than what we can reach with our man-made accelerators. So cosmic rays, they're mainly protons um, or heavier nuclei. Um, yeah, so they're basically the same particles that we accelerate at LHC at CERN. Um, but we reach the, the um, uh, our accelerators in the universe, obviously, reach energies uh, 10 million times higher than what we can reach with our um, yeah, largest machine built on Earth to accelerate high energy particles. So cosmic rays tell us that there have to be some incredible accelerators out there in the universe. So obviously you want to know what, what are those accelerators, which sources and which processes are capable of putting so much energy in, in, in those charged particles. Now, the problem about cosmic rays is that like, we can observe them on Earth, um, but because they are charged particles, they will be deflected on their way from the source to us by magnetic fields. So once they reach us here, on Earth, we can detect them, but the direction that we can measure will not point back to the origin of the source anymore because they get scrambled by magnetic fields. And this is now where the neutrinos enter the game because high energy neutrinos would be produced by interactions of those cosmic rays in or close to the source. And those are neutral particles, so they can travel straight to us without being affected by magnetic fields. So neutrinos could now tell us what is the direction of those high energy cosmic rays that we're interested in. And at the same time, we need um, our classical photons to tell us what is actually in that direction. So neutrinos would tell us where to look and then photons hopefully tell us what type or what kind of source is in that direction. So we really want to combine all those three messengers to get a more complete picture here. Um, so when I talk to astronomers about neutrinos, um, I, I realized I have to make very clear that there's two very different processes how you can produce neutrinos. So one has to distinguish between what I call low energy neutrinos at um, MeV energies. Those are produced in nuclear processes, uh, for example, and this is how neutrinos were first discovered um, in nuclear power plants. Um, but we've also seen them from astrophysical sources from the sun and from, um, from supernova 87A. Uh, so that was the first and only time there was an um, um, extra solar detection of neutrinos. Um, but those are MeV neutrinos um, that are produced in, in those nuclear decay processes. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, many orders of magnitude um, different. Uh, those are TeV to PeV neutrinos. So a million times more energy um, um, is what I will be talking about today. And those neutrinos, they're not produced in nuclear processes. They're produced in interactions of high energy cosmic rays. Basically in something that uh, we could call a cosmic, uh, a cosmic beam dump experiment. So what we need as an ingredient to produce those high energy neutrinos is an accelerator. 
obviously it's not a ring like the Large Hadron Collider, but it's some natural accelerator in, in some source, um, probably with some strong magnetic fields, maybe involving a supermassive black hole. And those sources would produce high, high energy protons. Um, that's one ingredient. So we need uh, accelerated protons. And then the second ingredient is a target. And that could be some um, material, some matter around the source, or it could also be a photon target. So a radiation field close to the source. And then those high energy cosmic rays can interact with the target. And then those interactions would produce high energy neutrinos. And typically those neutrinos then take uh, on average, 5% of the energy of the, of the parent proton. So if we have high energy protons, we would also get high energy neutrinos in that, uh, in that type of interactions. So in a little bit more detail, what, what do we actually expect in the source? So we have uh, those two different processes, either the protons interact with other protons, so with matter close to the source, or you could also, if you have a strong radiation field close to the source, you would have protons interacting with the photons at low energies. And then what happens is you produce a hadronic cascade. This is the uh, x in this, in this equation. But what is important is you produce pions in that process. Um, so you can produce neutral and charged pions. The neutral pions will immediately decay to two gamma rays. That's one process. And the charged pions would decay to a muon and a neutrino, and then the muon would decay again to an electron, and then you get more neutrinos. So from the decay of the charged pion, in the end, you would get three neutrinos. So now you might be asking why. So if there is also gamma rays produced in this process, why don't we just look at the gamma rays if we want to know where the cosmic rays are, are coming from? And the answer is that gamma rays are not exclusively produced in those hadronic processes. So we distinguish between hadronic and leptonic processes. So hadronic processes are those involving protons, and leptonic processes are those involving electrons. And we really want to know where the high-energy protons come from. So we need to know what are the hadronic accelerators in the, in the universe. And high-energy gamma rays can be produced in the decay of pions. So there will be a hadronic process, but they could also be produced uh, in other processes involving electrons. And that could be uh, Bremsstrahlung or inverse Compton scattering. Um, so that is the problem about gamma rays. When we detect them, we never know if they were produced by electrons or by protons. However, neutrinos are really now considered the smoking gun signature of hadronic acceleration because they are only produced in those hadronic processes. So if we detect neutrinos, then we know that there had to be some high energy protons present in the source um, interacting with some kind of target producing the high energy neutrinos. So that's why neutrinos are so interesting. There is a second reason why uh, neutrinos are actually very cool messengers from the high energy universe. And that is because if we, if we only look at photons, eventually the universe became, becomes op opaque at high energies. Uh, and this is illustrated here. So as a function of the photon energy, you see the mean free path um, of, of a photon. And at low energies, basically, a photon could travel through the whole galaxy. Um, however, if you reach higher energies, then in the extreme case, at uh, roughly 1 um, PeV, uh, what happens is that those high energy photons would start to interact with the low energy photons of the extragalactic background light. Um, and those interaction uh, will become very, uh, very likely because the cross section grows. And at PV energies, um, the free mean path of, a, of this high energy photon will reduce to um, a, a distance to our galactic center. So we could detect PV photons from our own galaxy, but we could not detect them from distant galaxies. So really, if we want to directly to do astronomy at PEV energies, then we have to use neutrinos because they open this window to the extragalactic um, universe at PEV energies, something that, that we cannot do with, with photons. So those are two cool reasons to uh, look for neutrinos. Um, at the same time, however, neutrinos are really, really, really hard to detect. Um, that is because the, uh, the cross section of the neutrino to interact is, is very, very small because they only interact with a weak force. 
So either we have to wait very long to detect a neutrino, or we need a giant detector volume to be able to catch those very rare interactions of the neutrinos that we are interested in. Um, and that is, that is what has been built, a huge detector uh, at the South Pole, uh, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. That's the largest neutrino detector um, currently operating. And you see a sketch here. So I told you it is located in Antarctica um, and actually at the geographic South Pole, which is more or less in the, in the center of the continent of Antarctica. Um, and the detector consists of 86 so-called strings. So we drilled two and a half kilometer deep um, holes into the ice and we deployed um, two and a half kilometer cables in, in this ice. And the bottom kilometer of the cables is um, um, equipped with optical sensors. And those are like roughly basketball size glass spheres, uh, very thick glass to uh, protect uh, the instrumentation from the um, large pressure down there. And inside, uh, we have a photomultiplier that is sensitive to a very weak light signal. So in total, we have more than 5,000 of those optical modules in the ice. And that means we have an instrumental volume of a cubic kilometer. So the bottom kilometer of this two and a half kilometer deep cable uh, are instrumented, and that forms a cubic kilometer of ice uh, equipped with very sensitive um, light sensors. So what do we actually see with those? So we have this grid of light sensors now in the detector. And what we see is not the neutrino itself, but we only see, we can only um, detect the neutrino indirectly. So once the neutrino interacts, it would produce uh, secondary charged particles. And those secondary charged particles now travel faster than the speed of light in the medium. And when they do that, they emit Cherenkov light. And this is what we detect. So we detect the Cherenkov light emitted by the secondary charged particles produced in the neutrino interaction in the ice. And we distinguish um, two different um, event signatures. One is called um, shower event. Um, that happens if you have an uh, electron or tau neutrino um, interacting in the ice, and then you produce an electron or tau, depending on the flavor of the neutrino, um, and you get this spherical Cherenkov light signature. Uh, or this also happens if you have a neutral current interaction. Um, and in the other case, where we have a muon neutrino interacting, um, it produces a muon, and the muon would make a very long track through the detector. Um, and then you see this. Uh, extended light pattern. Um, and what you actually see there, so each of the little dots is uh, a module that was hit by photons and different colors indicate different arrival time of the photons and different size of the blobs indicate how much light was detected by that individual sensor. And, and you see that we can quite accurately measure the time on microsecond scales here. And from this uh, arrival time difference of the photons at the sensors, we can now reconstruct the direction um, of the muon traveling through the det detector. And the neutrino had a lot of energy that was given to the muon. Um, and at high energies, actually, the incoming neutrino and the muon will be aligned. Um, so if we want to measure now the direction of the neutrino, which is obviously important if we want to do astronomy, um, then we have to stick to this track signature because only that one actually gives us a decent um, angular reconstruction um, of the direction of the incoming neutrino. This other signature is also interesting because all of the light is contained in the detector, so it gives us a more accurate energy measurement. While in, in this case, where maybe the interaction happens somewhere outside of the detector, you lose part of the light, so it's harder to reconstruct the energy. Um, but yeah, for what we want to do to point somewhere in the sky, we, we need a good angular reconstruction. So we stick to the muon track events in the, in the detector. At the same time, we also have to deal with a background, unfortunately. So what we're looking for is a cosmic neutrino reaching us from somewhere in the universe. And then this neutrino would interact somewhere in or close to the detector and produce a muon. And this muon is what we actually 
see in the detector. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. But at the same time, there's cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere. And in, in those processes, they produce particle showers. And in the particle showers, you also produce muons and you produce atmospheric neutrinos. So the atmospheric neutrinos can also enter the detector, interact, and produce a muon. And also the muons could reach our detector, but only if um, the cosmic ray shower was um, above the detector. So um, in, in the um, uh, in the southern hemisphere, um, because otherwise the muon would have to pass the Earth, uh, but the muon cannot do that. So the Earth basically protects us from the cosmic ray muons, but not from the cosmic ray neutrinos. And I think this is nicely illustrated in, in this plot. So as a function of the um, uh, zenith angle of the of the incoming neutrino, you see the background of atmospheric neutrinos shown in red. So the atmospheric neutrinos come from everywhere, and we cannot really distinguish them from the cosmic neutrinos that we're looking for, um, only maybe by, by their energy. Um, and we have this huge background of atmospheric uh, muons, but only in the southern sky. So one way to get rid of the background is to reduce our search to the northern hemisphere. Another way to suppress the background of atmospheric muons is to look for so-called starting events. So events that um, yeah, start inside the detector. So you can use the outer layer as a veto. So if it would have been an atmospheric muon, it had to sneak in somehow into the detector, right? It's, it's coming from the atmosphere, enters the detector. So it would leave some light also in the outer layers. But if we have a starting event that um, yeah, only had an interaction inside the detector, and then you see the muon leaving, basically, then you can be pretty sure that it has to be uh, induced by a neutrino and not by, by a muon. So those are the two um, ways you can, um, you can use to get rid of the uh, atmospheric background that we are dealing with. Um, so here, here a few numbers. I already said that there is a huge background of uh, muons from the from the atmosphere. So we have a detection rate of roughly 3,000 events per second. Uh, we can compare compare this now to the uh, neutrinos that are produced in the atmosphere. There we expect roughly one every five minutes. And this compared now to the rate of cosmic neutrinos. So those we're actually looking for. Here we expect. Uh, 120 per year. So we're really looking for the needle for the needle in the haystack here. Um, nevertheless, despite we have this huge background, we succeeded in 2013 for the first time to measure a diffuse flux of high energy neutrinos. And this is uh, shown here. Um, so as a function of energy, you see the flux scaled with the square of energy. Um, and you see the neutrino measurement in the middle. So we, um, so we at the highest energies, we, we are roughly at uh, PV energies. Um, and we're starting at yeah, roughly TV energies here. This is the neutrino diffuse flux measurement. You, two, you see two different lines. Those are just two different uh, channels, how we detect the neutrinos, corresponding to the two different ways how we can suppress the background. Uh, but those two measurements are consistent. Now we can bring them into perspective by comparing them to the diffuse uh, gamma ray flux, uh, shown here in, uh, in blue, measured by um, the Fermi satellite. And we can also compare it to the a diffuse flux of ultra high energy cosmic rays measured by um, the OG observatory shown in green. Um, so what is interesting about this comparison that in, in this representation, the fluxes are more or less on the same level, which tells us that similar energies are injected into those three messengers. Somehow makes you want to believe that they have the same origin, um, but we actually don't really know if that's true. We don't know where the high energy neutrinos come from at this point. We don't know where the high energy cosmic rays come from, but we have a pretty good idea where the diffuse gamma rays come from. Um, they are dominated by, uh, by blazers. Uh, so active galactic nuclei with a jet that is pointing in our direction. Those sources dominate the, uh, the gamma ray background, which, uh, which means that those sources are also very good 
candidates for the production of high energy neutrinos and high energy cosmic rays. So how can we now figure out where those neutrinos are coming from? So we detect very signif significantly detected this diffuse flux of high energy neutrinos. But the next step obviously is to try to find out where, the, where those neutrinos are coming from. And, and this basically shows a sky map um, of the neutrinos that we've measured with ice cube. Um, and keep in mind that this one is dominated by background. In the northern hemisphere, it will be dominated by um, atmospheric neutrinos, and in the southern hemisphere, dominated by um, atmospheric muons. So those two types of background we are we are dealing with. Um, those backgrounds are expected to be isotropically distributed at the sky, while the neutrino sources we are looking for obviously could now show up as clusters in the sky. So this is not actually the um, individual events I'm showing in this map, but it's the uh, so-called p-value. So basically the p-value tells us how likely a cluster that we see in the sky is due to just random background fluctuation, or could it actually be um, a source um, of high energy neutrinos somewhere, somewhere in the sky. So you want the p-value to be small, or here we show the, the negative logarithm of the p-value. So when that one is large, that means the, the chance probability of, see, of seeing an excess uh, like the one we, we find here um, just from background fluctuations is, is uh, small. So the circles here show the uh, most significant positions in the sky, the most significant clusters in the sky. And now we can look at the, at the p-value at that position. Um, so this one, four times 10 to the minus six in the southern sky and the most significant one in the northern sky is um, three times 10 to the minus seven, uh, which is pretty significant. But now you have to keep in mind that we um, tested a lot of positions in the sky. So basically you get a very large look elsewhere effect, or maybe you want to call it look everywhere effect in this case, because we look in all positions of the sky. So we get a large trial factor and we have to correct this p-value with this very large trial factor with the fact that we have looked in many positions of the sky. And once you do that, our um, seemingly very significant p-value becomes actually not significant at all anymore. Um, so that is a problem in neutrino astronomy that we have to deal with those large trial factors. Um, however, there is a way to get around this if we would actually know where to look, then we can reduce the number of trials. So we can make some educated guess that, okay, there is certain positions in the sky that are actually likely uh, high energy accelerators, and then those should also be neutrino sources. So if we reduce our search to a list of sources that is potentially interesting, we can reduce the trial factor. And, and we have done this with IceCube, we um, created a list of 110 predefined sources based on their gamma ray flux. Because you, you saw at the beginning that there is a connection of high energy gamma rays and neutrinos. So that's the yeah, best guess we can, we can make at this point. And now instead of looking at uh, all the positions in the sky, now we reduce ourselves to this 110 predefined positions in the sky. And we, find, we, we look at the most significant um, source. And the most significant source actually that we find in this list of 110 sources is this galaxy NGC 1068. And um, this is actually, is the, the position corresponds to um, the hottest spot found in the entire northern sky. Um, this is the position of NGC 1068. But now, since we have a smaller trial factor, the um, trial corrected p-value is actually uh, almost three sigma. So by making an educated guess and defining a list of sources, we have now reduced the trial factor and actually ident identified uh, um, a three sigma significant um, source in the sky. So let's have a closer look at the, at the position of the source. Um, so here you, you see now a zoom in of the p-value map. Um, so this is the uh, most significant position in the northern sky, and the location of NGC 1068 is very close to, to this hotspot that we, that we find in the sky. NGC 1068, also known as M77, is a nearby 
um, Safer 2 Galaxy. So it is an AGN and it also has star forming activity. So both of those could actually be a source of high energy neutrinos. Um, and what we find actually that the neutrino spectrum is pretty soft. Now we can com compare what we find in neutrinos with the gamma ray measurements. So in, in green, we see the uh, neutrino spectrum. And as you see, it, it falls pretty rapidly. So it's a soft spectrum. Um, and as you saw at the beginning, the neutrinos are always co-produced with high energy gamma rays. Because when you produce um, the charged pions that decay and produce neutrinos in the source, you also produce neutral pions that decay to gamma rays. So it's unavoidable that you produce those gamma rays in the same place where you produce the high energy neutrinos. So it's interesting to compare the uh, neutrino measurement to the gamma ray measurements. Um, so that's done in this plot. So in red, you see the gamma rays measured by the Fermi satellite. And in blue and in black, you see um, a measurements from, um, uh, from HESS and MAGIC at very high energy gamma ray energies. And um, you see that at highest energies, those are actually upper limits, OK? So they, they didn't detect anything with um, MAGIC and HESS at uh, very high energies. And also, if you somehow try to extrapolate from, from Fermi, then uh, it's clear that the gamma ray flux is much, much lower compared to the neutrino flux, which is interesting. And that tells us something. If we believe that the neutrinos come from that source, tells us that the gamma rays that are produced together with the neutrinos have to be absorbed in the source. So there has to be some environment where the neutrinos are accelerated that at the same time absorbs the gamma rays, um, which is actually tricky because um, an environment that absorbs gamma rays is also pretty hostile to proton acceleration. Um, so that would be a problem in, in the models trying to explain uh, the neutrino production. But you can, I guess, come up with some two zone model where you produce neutrinos and gamma rays in one place, and then in another place, you absorb the gamma rays, maybe. But you already see that the neutrinos can tell us something unique about the source that otherwise we, um, yeah, we, we wouldn't have learned by just looking at the electromagnetic emission. So this source is the first hint for a high energy neutrino emitter. Uh, and I want to pause for a moment if there's any urgent questions at this point before I switch gears a little bit and talk about other types of sources that we could be looking for. Just looking, there's nothing in the chat. Um... Anybody okay. wants to ask a question? I think I think we'll just uh, go on for the can moment. I, oh yeah. <laughs> so can I ask why why is it hostile to uh, neutrino? Um, so you need very uh, dense photon fields to yes. uh, absorb the gamma rays, right? And and those dense photon fields would also um, they also the protons would interact with. With those, right? If you if you try to accelerate the protons, um, then they would also interact and lose energy uh, in those in those interaction with the with the photons. So it's harder to to get them to high energies. Okay, so you would not get the high energy neutrinos in the first place. Okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think uh, we can move on. Thanks, Anna. I don't see okay. any other question. Okay. Then I, I continue. Um, so next, um, so the first thing I presented was look basically in the neutrino sky and try to see clusters somewhere in the sky. That is one way to identify neutrino sources. Uh, the other way would be to use likely astrophysical neutrinos as triggers to then look for an, a possible electromagnetic counterpart. Um, and IceCube is doing this. Um, with the so-called Target of Opportunity program that already started in, in April 2016. And the idea is here that with IceCube at the South Pole, we um, are measuring neutrinos in real time, and we measure the energy and their direction, and we select the most interesting events. And interesting here means that they have high energy, so we can um, 
um, we are more likely to distinguish them from atmospheric background. Um, and they also have to be of this track type. So they have a decent angular, angular resolution. So we detect them with ice cube in, in real time. And once we have the direction, we broadcast this information um, to a network of telescopes all over, all over the world. And those telescopes then ideally would immediately slew and look in the direction um, of the high energy neutrino and then hopefully detect some electromagnetic counterpart in, in that direction uh, of the sky. And um, yeah, this program increases our sensitivity, especially to uh, transient or variable sources that maybe if we collect all the neutrinos and then we look a year later, then maybe the source is already gone. Um, and obviously it also would help us to detect something that maybe we hadn't been looking for. Right? Because we just look, is something going on there? Maybe without defining a certain type of source class that we, that we are after. Um, so we, we uh, find those interesting neutrino events roughly um, 10 times per year. And we can do the um, reconstruction of the, of the direction in less than 30 seconds. And then we send a, a GCN notice and everyone can, uh, can um, receive those and, and then point their telescope in, in that direction. And uh, I want to show you one famous uh, example for, for such an event. There was um, IC 170922A, so IC stands for Ice Cube, uh, and this neutrino was detected in September, um, in se September 2017. And it was a high energy neutrino with almost 300 TeV uh, energy. And it uh, had a signalness of 56%. That means uh, it was there is, yeah, roughly 50% chance that this is an astrophysical event and not an atmospheric background event. Um, and this is an animation. So you see there is some noise in the detector, single single hits, and now you see that there's the muon entering the te detector. You see the light, nice um, light pattern emerging along the muon track, uh, and already by eye you can see that you can. Reconstruct the direction of the of the event pretty well. And we managed to reconstruct this uh, to an area of the sky of one square degree. That's the 90% uh, uncertainty region of this high energy neutrino. But by itself, this neutrino is not very interesting because there's still a 50% chance that it is of atmospheric origin. However, now if we combine this with gamma ray information, it actually becomes very interesting. So this movie shows the gamma ray sky. And it shows actually a one week period subtracted from the average gamma ray sky. So what you what you see here is, is the, only the variability in the gamma ray sky seen by Fermi in GeV energies. And now you see in 2016, IceCube has started their real time program. So you see high energy neutrinos plopping up here in the in the sky. And then something interesting happened in September 2017. Um, and as you see, the, also the gamma ray sky is actually quite busy. Uh, and now in 2017, if you zoom in, you see that there is a high energy neutrino alert exactly on top, on top of a variation uh, in the gamma ray sky. Uh, so this source that, that showed variation was actually a known gamma ray source, a gamma ray blazer. So again, a blazer is an active galactic nuclear with a jet pointing in our direction. Um, and this blazer, um, is called uh, Texas 0506. And that was already a non gamma ray source. It's actually among the 50 brightest sources in the Fermi Blazer catalog that brings it among the top 3% of all the blazers seen by Fermi. Uh, and on the left, you see the gamma ray light curve um, um, in days relative to the arrival of the high energy neutrino. So you see there is some variation in the past, but there was really a huge flare at the time where the high energy neutrino arrived. Um, so that is interesting. Um, obviously, now we have to, uh, well, that wasn't for me. I, I should add that then also MAGIC detected the source for the first time in very high energy uh, TV gamma rays. And here you see in red, you see the 90% uncertainty region of the neutrino. And you see that the source is actually yeah, very close to the best fit neutrino, neutrino direction. Uh, so that makes it even more interesting because it, it even reaches 
high energies that are closer to the closer to the neutrino energy that that we have detected. Um, but now we have to uh, compute that how likely is something like this happening just by chance? If you if you point somewhere in the sky, how how likely is it to find a flaring blazer in that direction? And and we uh, have done this calculation, and we also include trials that this basically this experiment was done already several times because IceCube has already been sending out uh, alerts before this, and we find that it's actually pretty unlikely that you have an alignment like this just by chance. Um, so the significance of this connection uh, reaches three sigma. Not five sigma as the particle physicists usually want to see for, for detection, um, but still this, this was actually the first uh, and only three sigma result we, we had found with ice cube. Uh, so that is pretty exciting. Now, if you if you believe that this high energy neutrino really came from the source, then it means that there had to be high energy protons in the source that uh, interacted and produced the neutrino. So the, the proton energy had to reach at least six PeV to produce this 300 TeV neutrino. Um, now we can look at the multi-messenger spectral energy distribution. So I already showed you the, the GeV gamma rays that Fermi has detected uh, and uh, gamma rays detected by magic, uh, those ones here, um, but the source is also visible in X-rays and optical and in, uh, and in radio. And now you can make an attempt to also put the neutrino measurement in here, but there was only one single neutrino detected. So it's basically impossible to convert this into a flux. Uh, so that's why, why they're actually kind of measurements and upper limits combined here. Um, so the spectral energy distribution shows this typical two bump structure. And we are pretty sure that the low energy bump is produced by synchrotron radiation of electrons in the magnetic field of that source. And for the high energy bump, it's not so clear. It could either be produced also by electrons, maybe by the same electrons that produce the synchrotron radiation. Those electrons can um, do inverse Compton scattering and produce gamma rays. Or it could be actually protons in the source that interact and produce pions and those decay to gamma rays. So from looking only at the electromagnetic radiation, we cannot distinguish between those two processes. So we cannot be sure if this source is actually an hadronic accelerator. However, if we believe that the neutrino comes from the source, then it's a clear case. This has to be an hadronic accelerator. So coming back to our multi-messenger picture, there's clearly one point missing in that picture, and this is a theory, actually. So now the theorists have to take all the data and basically draw an image of the elephant, uh, or um, in our case, find a model that explains actually all the observations. Um, and that is actually that was actually done by several groups, so I'm only showing one result here. Um, but the model that fits the data best is actually a so-called leptohadronic model. So it's a combination of assuming that there is high energy electrons and high energy protons together in the source. And the contribution to the electromagnetic emission from, from the electrons is shown in, in orange. That's so this line here. So actually all the GeV gamma rays are dominated by the leptonic emission by the electrons. And then there is a subdominant uh, contribution from protons in the source that actually becomes important in the X-ray range and also in the high energy uh, gamma ray range. So this model actually can explain all the electromagnetic emission and also make some prediction shown here in red for the neutrinos that this source would, uh, would produce. <clears throat> So now the next question is, so the, the theorists believe the source can actually produce high energy neutrinos. Um, but the question is, is this, is this our answer? Do blazers produce all the ice cube neutrinos? And the answer is uh, probably not. Uh, and we found the answer by looking at now a large sample of gamma ray blazers detected by, uh, by Fermi. So more than uh, 800 blazers laser positions in the sky were used to look for a, um, a weak excess uh, from the combined emission of all those positions. And no excess was actually found, which tells us that um, 
or if it allows us to set an upper limit on the uh, contribution of the of blazers to the diffuse neutrino flux. Um, and, and here in um, gray, you see the, the measurement, that is the measured diffuse neutrino flux, and the upper limits we can set from this analysis are shown here in, in different colors. So in red, if we assume that the spectral shape is the same, then we can actually set pretty stringent upper limits. However, the spectral shape, shape doesn't have to be this, uh, the same. If you um, assume that blazers produce neutrinos following a different spectral shape, then actually you can explain um, some most of the high energy emission of the diffuse neutrino flux by blazers, but not the low energy emission. OK, so Fermi gamma ray blazers can only be responsible for a small fraction of the observed neutrino flux. And that um, can maybe be explained by assuming that there is actually two populations of neutrino sources. So at high energies, maybe it's blazers producing most of the diffuse flux. But then at low energies, it could be a different uh, population of sources. So blazers are interesting, but they are probably, while they are dominating the diffuse gamma ray flux, it seems they are not dominating the diffuse neutrino flux. So there has to be another type of source that uh, would contribute to, to this flux. So what could other possible sources be? There's many candidates, but I want to focus now on one specific uh, source class uh, that, that has been become very interesting. Uh, in the in the last year, and those are tidal disruption events. So a tidal disruption event happens if a star comes too close to a supermassive black hole. So you see what happens to the star; it will be um, ripped apart by the gravitational uh, forces of the supermassive black hole, and then the debris of the star will be accelerated onto the onto the black hole. And in some cases, you can also produce uh, relativistic jets coming out of, uh, um, of the uh, produced by the by the accretion. Um, so again, in pictures, you have the star coming too close to the black hole, the star will be distorted and then eventually ripped apart. The debris can form an accretion disk. And in some rare cases, you also get a relativistic particle jet. Um, so TDs be are becoming more interesting now because thanks to um, now new modern, mainly optical surveys, uh, the sample of detected TDEs actually grew um, a lot in the in the last one or two years. So now we have roughly 50 TDEs identified, and only three of them uh, have an identified uh, high energy jet. Um, so how can we now uh, try to find um, TDE counterparts to our high energy neutrinos? Um, they are best detected in the optical. So we set up an optical follow-up program to search for an optical counterpart to the high energy neutrino events. Uh, and this is done with, with several optical telescopes. Um, and, and I'm involved in, in several of those surveys, but I, I, I want to highlight now the one done, that is done with the Zwicky Transient Facility. That's an optical survey instrument on Mount Paloma in uh, Southern California. So the nice thing about ZTF is that it has a huge field of view, it has a 47 square degree field of view, um, which is probably the largest field of view, any professional um, optical uh, telescope. And that allows ZTF to actually um, scan the entire northern sky um, every night to a magnitude of 20 and a half. So what we do with ZTF is we follow up interesting neutrino events. But in addition, we also have all this archival data that ZTF has already uh, collected in the past. Um, so what we do when an interesting neutrino event arrives, we immediately receive this information with ZTF. Then we point ZTF in the position um, of the high energy neutrino event. And also here, the large field of view of ZTF is actually uh, very practical because we don't have to perform tiling normally, but with one single uh, exposure, we can cover the entire uncertainty region uh, of the high energy neutrino. Then we have a software package that allows us to now in this usually pretty large uncertainty region of the of the neutrino. So we're talking about several square degrees here yeah, normally. Um, we will of course find a lot of things in the sky. So we, we're looking for variable things, but even variable things, there are a lot in the sky in in a um, in an area of few square degrees. 
So we uh, start with rejecting stars and variable stars and planets, asteroids, um, because we think those would not be connected to the, to the neutrinos. And then we end up usually with a handful of candidates. Now we know exactly where they are in the sky. So now we can trigger further follow-up observations in a different wavelengths, uh, or also we can try to obtain a spectrum of the source to really identify what type of source we are looking for. And this is important to reject uh, other unrelated sources. For example, type 1a supernova, they are pretty common in the sky, but we don't think that they're actually, uh, they could be high energy sources producing high energy neutrinos. So those we could reject, but then there's other types of sources that we are interested in. So getting a spectrum is actually pretty important. And uh, thanks to this program, we identified um, one interesting source, AT 2019 DSG, uh, which is a TDE candidate. Um, and in the, in the ZTF black hole group, because we all have a hard time to uh, remember those uh, weird names of the sources, we uh, assign nicknames to the TDE candidates according to Game of Thrones characters. So this one is actually uh, Brand Stark. So Brand Stark is, is this guy shown in the picture here. And in the bottom picture, you see Robert. And Robert is, uh, a P was a PhD student in my group. Um, he just handed in his thesis and started a new job at Caltech actually uh, this week. Um, but he did most of the work, so he identified this, uh, this source. Uh, and you see the light curve uh, in the plot here. So you see the time in days relative to the discovery of the source. And we discovered the source, when we discovered the source, we took observations with ZTF and we quickly realized that there was already an interesting source in that direction, um, namely this TDE candidate. And now all the nice archival data of ZTF um, plays an important role because we, we see that the source actually uh, peaked uh, roughly 150 days before the neutrino, uh, before the neutrino arrival. Um, this tidal disruption event was um, happened at a redshift of 0.05, and we calculated the chance coincidence. So how likely do we find a TDE that is not related? And uh, also here, the chance coincidence is, is pretty small, 0.2% to find a TDE that is as bright as the one we, we have found here. So first we were puzzled that the neutrino arrived pretty late. Um, however, once we looked at data and other wavelengths, um, for example, the radio data, uh, we realized that there has to be an inner engine in the source that is actually active over a long time. And you see the radio data here. So th this is not a light curve here. You have the, the frequency, but the different colors indicate measurements at different time. And you actually see that uh, the source is getting brighter over time in, in radio, and then eventually it shifts to lower energies. Uh, from this, we, we calculated the uh, energy output and the, the radius of the source. And you see that is a steadily um, um, outputting energy. Uh, so the, the inner engine has to be active over a long time, which somehow made us believe that the neutrino also can arrive actually at later times. So this is the first indication that uh, tidal disruption events could be high energy neutrino sources. And afterwards, there have been different models trying to explain where those uh, neutrinos could actually be produced. It could either be in a relativistic jet, it could be in the corona or in the, in the disk um, or an outflow produced by, uh, by the tidal disruption event. Um, and I start to run out of time, but I want to uh, show you there is actually a hint that there is an emerging trend that TDEs are high energy neutrino sources because we identify the second source. Uh, this has not been published yet, um, but this is just a teaser. So uh, in addition to Brent Stark, now we also have Taiwan, and you see the two light curves here compared. Uh, in case of Taiwan, actually the neutrino arrived one year after the peak in, in the optical. Um, but Taiwan itself is uh, it's much further away compared to, uh, compared to Bren. Um, that's why the, the luminosity shown here is actually uh, much higher for, uh, for Taiwan. But in terms of flux, they were actually, uh, they were actually comparable. Uh, and this work was done by, by Simeon Roy, another student in my group. Um, so this is some interesting 
indications that actually tile disruption events uh, could be a very good source class for high energy neutrinos and thereby also of high energy cosmic rays. So that brings me more or less to the end. Uh, in the future, we will be able to do those searches much, much better because they, they are new neutrino telescopes on the horizon in the Mediterranean. The KM3 net detector is currently under construction. And once it's completed, it will also be one cubic kilometer, so similar size um, of ice cubes. And at the South Pole, we're planning uh, 10 times larger detector ice cube uh, Gen 2 um, that would then give us five times better sensitivity to neutrinos in this energy range. And that would be paired uh, with the new technology to, to detect even higher energy neutrinos with, uh, uh, with radio antennas at the, at the South Pole. So in summary, I hope I could convince you that neutrinos are really unique messengers from the high energy universe and that they are an important key to reveal the sources of high energy cosmic rays that are currently unknown. Uh, in order to do so, we, we need electromagnetic counterparts of the neutrinos that would tell us what are the interesting sources. And I showed you that we identified some first compelling candidates is this close by um, galaxy M77 is the gamma ray blazer and now also the tidal disruption event uh, that are all interesting source candidates. Um, so now the theorists have to do some work to develop consistent models that explain all the data that we have collected. Uh, and we observers have to do some work to um, find new sources and also probe other source classes. So I think we can, we can be um, tuned for, for what will happen in the near future. And maybe we also find sources that we mm. haven't actually expected. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. That was a fascinating review and outlook on this new field. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more developments with the new facilities and also the multi-wavelength analysis. We have time for maybe two questions before um, we formally end the colloquium. Afterwards, we can continue for a more informal discussion. So I see um, there's one hand up from Hendrik Lintz. Hendrik? Yeah, hello, Anna. Yeah, indeed fascinating. Um, maybe you mentioned it and I, I missed it. I mean, you single out now these tidal disruption events as, as potential sources. And I think you mentioned normal supernova type 1A uh, are not promising, are probably too weak. But uh, the sources that make gamma ray bursts, so kind of special supernova 2s or hypernovas, these could not be part at least of this neutrino stuff yeah that's that's a good point so gamma ray bursts have been actually the the most promising candidates before ice cubes started to to uh, to take data for high energy neutrinos and also for high energy cosmic rays and and i skipped this because we don't have enough time but i have some backup slides uh, showing so we yeah we look for gamma ray bursts uh, because they are very good candidates the idea is that you have also you produce shocks in this uh, very relativistic jets of the gamma ray burst, and in, in those shocks you can accelerate particles, and then they could produce neutrinos. And we looked for those neutrinos, and actually this is um, it's a great search because you can suppress the background of atmospheric events a lot by looking only at the very short time window where the where the gamma rays occurred, and you also know the position, so you can really suppress the background a lot. But we haven't found an excess of neutrinos. Okay. Um, at the direction of the gamma reverse and the, the prompt emission phase, right? Because when we only look at the prompt uh, emission phase, then we are very sensitive because we can really suppress the background a lot. We didn't find anything, so we can now um, exclude that uh, GRBs are significant cont contributors to the diffuse neutrino flux. That doesn't mean that GRBs are not neutrino sources, right? But most of the neutrinos we see are not produced at least in this prompt phase. Then we have other analysis looking for precursor neutrinos and afterglow neutrinos, and then you become a bit less sensitive because you, you get more background. So here it's, the situation is less clear, but the, I guess most a naive model, you expect the neutrinos at the prompt phase, and then we didn't find any there. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. Uh, Brian Reville. Hi. Uh, 
hear me? Can Faintly. You hear me? Faintly. Let me try. I always have this problem. Can you hear me now? I think we can just about. Okay, you know, okay I can Anna? share. So thank you very much, Anna, for this very, um, very nice and accessible talk. I really enjoyed it. I, I just had a, a question about uh, Texas 0506. So the flare that coincided with the neutrino detection, was this unique in terms of flares from that specific laser and also unique with respect, uh, was there any unique feature with respect other than the neutrino possible correlation with, with other lasers and flares? Um, I mean, it's, it is one of the brightest sources in the, in the catalog and it is an extreme flare, but it's not the, it's not the only flare like this in the sky, right? So you, you, you could ask yourself, like, what, shouldn't we see neutrinos from, from other flares? But since we saw only one neutrino, um, we have this, um, what we call the, the Eddington bias, right? So we kind of, um, where we look for this. So let's imagine there's 100 sources in the sky and all of them have a, uh, have a Poisson expectation of 0 0.01, okay? And then like suddenly one of them shows an overfluctuation and this will be the one we are looking at because we not only then we can actually see this one neutrino and all the other ones we do not look at. Um, so it's not so surprising, right? That this is, yeah, is a bright laser, but maybe not the brightest um, in, in the sky. So I think this is how you could maybe explain this. Has has this laser flared since? I think there was a second flare, um, but we didn't see any any neutrinos. Um, there was also something I didn't mention. There was also a lower energy neutrino excess from the same source in. Um, I think I have a backup slide. Maybe, but yeah, so this one. Um, so this is uh, again the same blazer, right? And you see this huge flare in 2017 where we see the single high energy neutrino. And then what we what we did, we uh, now we know the position of the sky. So again, we don't have a trial factor. So we can go and look where the low energy neutrinos from that source. And we, we do a flare search. So we have basically a box time window that we vary and we check when do we find an excess. And we, uh, we found an excess that is three and a half sigma in, in itself in 2014, 2015. And now interestingly, there's nothing happening in gamma rays at that time. So this really, yeah, came as a surprise and it's very hard for theorists to, to model this because it's, it's hard to get, to get rid of the gamma rays. So it's not really clear if the source somehow is changing its nature and, and once has a neutrino flare without gamma rays and then we see the neutrino with the gamma rays. So it's, it's a bit of an open question, what's, what's going on there. There has been actually, I mean, one thing I should mention, there's some interesting observations in, in radio that somehow maybe make the source special. Um, some people claim that there was actually, there might be two jets and there was a collision of, of the jets, or there maybe was some precession of one jet and then one part of the, this jet basically collided with the other one. So maybe that could be an explanation why you, why you see the neutrinos here. But there is a lot of open questions about the source. Okay, thanks. I don't see any more questions right now. So but we can, as I said, continue after the colloquium. Before we thank Anna, I'd just like to share my screen um, and uh, broadcast an advertisement for next week's talk. This will be on a related topic by Eduardo Banados, a local speaker. Uh, we'll be talking about the very most distant uh, quasars and what they mean for galaxy and black hole evolution. So um, now I think we'd just like to thank Anna again by opening our microphones and uh, our screens and thank her very much. Thank you, Anna, for this extremely interesting talk. Do stay around afterwards. We have more, more discussions for you.